and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting One. And as I was thinking about our church service this morning and thinking about our songs and, of course, listening to this song, I was thinking about a book that I read several years ago and I recommended it to our Bible study group on Wednesday night. The book, Voices from the Edge of Eternity. And this book is filled with story after story after story of those who left this world and went into the next. Those who went to heaven, sadly those who experienced hell. And when I read this book, it literally transformed my spiritual life. Because it brought into reality the fact that I am one breath away, I am one heartbeat away from seeing Jesus Christ face to face. As I have had the opportunity to do ministry work for the last 30 plus years now, the book, Voices from the Edge of Eternity, were no longer words written on paper to me. They became stories that I experienced as I sat in the hospital room, in someone's living room, in their bedroom, as they were saying goodbye to this life. I wish I could tell you all the experiences were heavenly. Again, sad but true, some of them were hellish. And when I think about all of those who have died and gone on, experienced the splendor, the joy of heaven, I think about how great is our God. The words that these people heard as they were being transported from this life into the next. The songs that they were hearing. The angelic choir that they were listening to. It was something this world has never seen, will never experience, because it was something only heaven could produce. And I would encourage you this morning, before you leave this church service anyway, to come to know the God who says when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. The God who says to you, revive that spirit inside of you. You do not have to be experiencing survival in your Christian life. There is revival available to you. Would you allow the words in the song, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, to speak to your heart, to make a difference in you. Would you let the words and how great is our God truly work inside your heart to the place that you say, God, you are great. You are wonderful. You are awesome. You are more than what Isaiah said when he called you wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace. You're so great. You're so awesome. And you're so wonderful. If we would ever stop for a moment and think about how the Jewish people back in the Old Testament worshipped the music that they played, how they experienced their position in Christ with the songs, the words that they chose. For most of us, it would be foreign to our ears because we had never heard it before. As I picture Nehemiah and his band of soldiers his dedicated workers as they're on that wall. I've often imagined them singing as they worked. Trowel in one hand, the other hand on their sword or their weapon. Singing away as they worked on the wall. When I think about that, I want you to think about this. It wasn't always good for them on that wall. The heat of the day sometimes was unbearable. To watch the armies march against them was somewhat intimidating. 
And so when we think about all the pressure and the stressors that these people experienced on that wall, to erect that wall for the glory of God, we would have to think about the stressors and the pressures that we experience as we try to rebuild our lives. When I was a child, like many of you, I read some nursery rhymes and one of the nursery rhymes that I have learned to appreciate more and more again because when Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall it was a lost cause. But when we fall off the wall and all the pieces of a broken life are there God is in the business of putting those pieces back together again. That's how great our God is. In Nehemiah chapter 7 and verse number 2 the Bible says that I, Nehemiah, gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem. The word charge in our King James Bible means to give authority over the fort, to give authority over the city. To be in charge of the military. To be in charge of the safety of the citizens. For he was a faithful man. Notice what his qualifications were. He was a faithful man. Nehemiah didn't look for someone who fit the bill because he had the image or the look of someone that could make a great general or a master sergeant. He looked for someone who was a faithful man. Do you suppose that there were those within that city that thought to themselves, of course he's going to pick his brother. It's a setup. Why, of course he's going to pick the one closest to him. Why, he didn't give anyone else a chance. But the truth is, Nehemiah said, I picked him and I picked Hananiah because they were faithful men. Sometimes the words that come from the Bible or words that pastors or preachers sometimes have to use are cutting words. They're words that pierce our heart. But at the same time, we have to understand that the Word of God is a two-edged sword. It cuts when it goes in and when you pull it out, it cuts again. So the Word of God is meant to get our attention. So when Nehemiah spoke these words about his brother Hanai and his other friend Hananiah, he said that these men were faithful men. And they feared God above many. Now what a compliment that is to Hananiah and to Hananiah, but... If you were a listener and you were a participant on the wall, you would almost think that statement is filled with some sarcasm. Well, I work too. I'm a faithful man. I'm a faithful woman. I fear God. Dare him. Set his brother Hananiah and Hananiah as rulers over this fortress, over this city because I'm just as faithful as they are see when someone possesses that attitude it's a heart relationship with God humility should always kick in when we serve God not pride I am humbled that God saw fit to use me in any way in any shape in any form there are those that, I humbly say, are more qualified, more certified, could do a much better job. But for whatever reason, God has chosen me to do what He wants me to do with my life. And the truth is, there are those that could say, that are even here this morning, God could use someone else besides me. I'm the most unqualified. I'm the most unavailable. But God sometimes uses the unqualified the unavailable 
because he knows that your heart is right. So let's look at our topic for this morning. The challenge, the Bible challenge, Nehemiah chapter 7. What to do after the walls are built? And Nehemiah said in the very beginning, the walls must go up. And then after the walls were completed, what's next? When we think about our lives and as we rebuild our lives because of something major that's come into our lives that's caused us to stop for a moment and say, life is going to be different now. Life as I knew it is over. I now have to set new priorities. I have to set new goals. I have to think differently. I know that I have to act differently. I know that I have to do this, do that, etc., etc., etc. Once you rebuild the walls of your life, it's not over. You have to keep on working, ministering. As the song says, let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. As we rebuild our lives and as we begin to build this ministry and build this church, we never want to become status quo. We never want to become mediocre. We never want to level out. A preacher once said that when we flatline because we're leveling out, that means we're dying. So you have the responsibility where you are now in your life to pick up the broken pieces, to pick up what's left of your shattered dreams and move forward positively. Nehemiah said the walls must go up. He rallied the people to rebuild the walls and that they did. But the job is not over because if it were over, Nehemiah chapter 6 would end and there would be no more chapters. There would be no more information. So there's much more to be done. And let's see what else there is to be done this morning. When we think about what Nehemiah has done so far and what the people have done so far, they've accomplished something great. And you know, when someone can pull themselves up out of the pit of despair, out of that deep dark valley, and begin to rebuild their lives, they are to be commended for that. There's something motivating them to do that. There's something that's causing them to dig deep down inside to say, you know what, it's time that I put my life back together again. It's time that I put God first and foremost in my life. The bottom line is, if, as others have said to me, and I've done it myself, I've let God slip from first place in my life. And the truth is, we're to have no other gods before us. Again, looking at verse number 2. That I gave my brother Hanani, and Hanani, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem. For he was a faithful man and feared God above many. He was willing to go above and beyond his call of duty. There was an article in Sports Illustrated a few years ago about a football player. The article was about Raymond Berry. Raymond Berry was a scrawny kid. One leg was shorter than the other. His feet and hands were big and he wore big pop bottle glasses. Because of his deficiencies, he had to work harder than his teammates in order to play well. So while they partied, he studied games from NFL players. I'm going to stop there for just a moment because I want you to know the time and place that Raymond Berry lived. He did not live in a society yet where we could have videotaping. He did not live in a society where we could hook up to cable and program what television shows or sports shows we want to watch. So he could go back and rewind the tape and stop it little bit by little bit to watch how these players were making their moves. No, for Raymond Berry, when he was about 14 or 15 years old, he had to take a piece of paper in his hand, watch the NFL players do their plays. He would write them down as quick as he could, draw stick figures, and immediately when that game was over, he would run, not expecting his parents to take him to the football field, but he would run there, get out on the football field, and imitate what the NFL players were doing. He was sold out. He was dedicated. He was willing to go above and beyond his call of duty. 
And I'll share with you in just a moment why all of this is important. He wrote down their every move, went to the field and practiced their moves again and again until they were perfected. Later, he was selected to play for the Baltimore Colts as a wide receiver. After making the team, he didn't say, I did it, and then relax. Instead, he worked harder. Each night after everyone went home, he kind of gives it away here, doesn't it? First of all, Baltimore Colts, or is now the Baltimore Ravens, he and Johnny Unitas, the quarterback, would go out on the field and practice. In 1958, his team played in the NFL championship, which was known as the greatest game ever played. Look what else we learn about Raymond Berry. In that game, Raymond made a championship record catch of 12 passes and a touchdown which led to his overtime team into victory. After the successful game, he again didn't say, I made my goal, it's time to take a break. Rather, he worked even harder to improve himself. At the end of his football playing career, he held an NFL record of 631 receptions and 68 touchdowns and made the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But at the end, he didn't say, I did it, I'm through, time to retire. Instead, he went on to become the head coach of the New England Patriots, where he led his team into two playoffs in the Super Bowl, down in the bottom right-hand corner. Obviously, Raymond is no longer with us. Reminds me of what I said a few weeks ago when I talked about that trip through the cemetery. And even though it's not something we want to think about and we like to think more positively about life than the fact that we're going to die. Bottom line is when you go to the cemetery, down in the bottom left hand corner is when we were born. And there's a little dash that separates our departure into the next life which is our death. That dash represents what we have done with our life. We have a short span by which to do something great. But yet in that short span, God has equipped us with all the tools, all the instruments that we need in order to make something great out of our life. And this is what this man did. So why am I telling you this football story? It's because Raymond Berry is a great example of what Nehemiah did after completing the wall of Jerusalem. After rebuilding it, Nehemiah didn't take a break. When most people complete something, they either stop growing or go downhill. I said a few minutes ago that God does not want us to be mediocre. God does not expect us to be status quo. God expects us to rise above what we're able to do humanly and give him the credit for all things that have been accomplished. If it were easy, God then would not be needed in our life. It's not, if it were something we could do on our own, then we'd place God on the back burner. And a lot of people truly believe that they can get through life without God. And I don't understand that. It's impossible to get through life without God. And if you do that, I don't know how you do it from second to second, minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, month to month, year to year. Because when God has His rightful place in our life, great things begin to happen. As we would think about Nehemiah's life, what would we find recorded about him outside of what we see in Scripture? In our lives, have we been challenged since we began this study to rise up and rebuild our lives or to build a ministry for Him? God has equipped us. God has given us the tools. God has given us His Word. Would you be willing to be a Nehemiah and rise up and build your life or help someone reconstruct theirs? The enemy, and we know this to be true, is in the destroying business. He's in the destruction business, but God is in the restoring and the reconstruction business. Are you willing to take your Bible as Raymond Berry took that piece of paper which eventually became a notebook filled with plays? Would you be willing to allow your Bible, this Bible, to transform your life into the kind of Christian that God wants you to be as Raymond Berry allowed his plays as a high school athlete 
to transform him into one of the greatest players the NFL has ever witnessed. Now for some, you're saying, I've never heard of this man. I don't know who this guy is. You're right. So soon, this life will be over. So soon, this life will pass. And we will too be forgotten, no matter how great our accomplishments have been on this earth. But I can promise you this, in heaven, there's a record that's being kept and God's going to reward us for our faithfulness. In today's passage, however, we learn a very important lesson. No matter what, we must never stop growing. And why is this? It's because God made man to always grow. When we took the seedlings, or the seeds, and placed them inside these little cups, well, you expected it to grow. You expected that little seed to take root and begin to sprout up and grow. And now we see the result of just a few weeks ago when the cups looked empty. Interesting, isn't it? One's growing. One's dead. By the way, I did not come in here and sabotage that for an illustration. Just so that you know. Something happened. I'm not a science teacher. I don't know. Maybe it was overwatered. I don't know. Maybe there's not enough uh, fertilizer in here. Maybe there's too much. I don't know. I don't know why that seed didn't grow. I don't know why Christians don't grow. Now, I can assume and I can presume why I think that's true. I can say why they're not in the Bible. But what if someone is in the Bible and they're not growing? There's a reason for growth to be stunted in the lives of Christians. I don't know. But what we want to see, because we're masters at taking that verse in the New Testament that says, By their fruits we shall know them. That's true. That's true. Absolutely. But what are we doing to help the Christian who's not growing? Do we condemn them? Do we judge them? Do we look at them and say why they're getting what they deserve? The truth is, if that were true, we'd all get what we deserved and we wouldn't be here this morning. We'd all be strapped forever in the flames of hell burning for all eternity. If we got what we deserved. But God is good. All the time, God is good. He's a good God. So we're to grow. This means we must grow into God's image. Now, we don't know yet what this plan is. Some of you have asked. Some of you have come up and told me what you think is in here. But you're not going to know really what this is until it grows to maturity, correct? We don't know who we are until we grow into maturity. Leave people alone. Let them grow. Don't condemn them. If you're going to do anything with their lives, help them grow. Be involved in their life. Invest yourself in their life. Let them know that you care. Let them know that... You they can count on you. That's what God wants. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said, Be perfect, or be mature. Therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect, that's why we must find a way to keep on maturing until the day we die. Until it's all over. I made my goal. Now, if you would, please open your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 7. If you do not have your Bible with you this morning, you can look up on the screen and the verses will be there for you. Nehemiah said, I made my goal, but he didn't quit, didn't retire, he kept on going. So what did Nehemiah do after completing the wall? How did he keep on growing? Nehemiah chapter 7 tells us three things. Number one, Nehemiah appointed leaders, verses 1 through 3. He registered the people, verses 4 through 69. And by the way, you're not going to have a heart attack. I'm not going to read all verses, all right, 4 through 69. Some of you are like, oh my gosh. I can't even pronounce some of those names in there. And if I have to endure that entire chapter of genealogies, I think I'll just die. No, you don't have to worry about that. He asked for financial support in verses 70 through 73. The walls of protection had been built and the gates had been put in place. The city was fortified. It was safe. When our lives are being reconstructed by God. And we start to feel safe again. 
we find ourselves reading our Bible, we find ourselves praying, or we find ourselves rejuvenated over the fact that there's a church to go to now. There's a place to go worship. There's a place of acceptance. And all of that is there. And you feel as though your city walls, your lives are being fortified. Now there's a place of safety. You're in a haven of rest. But it was still in danger of being attacked. Your life is always going to be in danger of being attacked by the enemy. Nehemiah needed to find a way to protect what he had worked so hard to build. I don't want anybody to take from me what I built. I don't want anybody to destroy what I've invested my life in. And nor should you. So he appointed gatekeepers who would watch the gates. By the way, think about it this way. And God has appointed guardian angels to watch over me, my children, as the gatekeeper of my life. Or Jesus as the gatekeeper of my soul. So he appointed gatekeepers who would watch the gates and open and close them at the proper time. Notice something else. Look at verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass when the wall was built like your life. I'm putting some things behind me, Ron. I'm going to put the past behind me and I'm going to begin now to rebuild my life. Now when it came to pass and I had set up doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed. Think about it. In a, with a little twist to it, now we're going to talk about the church. Singers, people will ask, why singers in the church? Why do churches do this? Some probably don't know why they do what they do, but for the most part it's scriptural that Nehemiah set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed. That I gave my brother Hanai and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. Like Nehemiah, we also need to guard the things that we have worked so hard to build. Doggone it, nobody's going to take my kids. That ought to be the cry of every mother and every father. They're my kids. And I love my kids. God gave me my kids. And I'm not going to let the enemy get in and destroy my family and my kids and my life. Amen. And that's a lot easier said than done. When we think about our lives and our families and how the enemy wants to get in and devour us, we have a responsibility to dig deep down inside as parents and pull it all together and get that inner strength that God gives. And we are to put everything that we have into our family because the enemy wants to destroy and devour everything that we have. To name a few, our jobs. Some have had their jobs stripped from them after years of service. A friend of mine that I went to high school with, about three years ago we were talking and he said to me, Ron, I had three months to go for 30 years of service to get my retirement. And can you believe they gave me my pink slip two days ago? I lost it all. Where am I going to go now at this point in my life and get another job? Some have said, where am I going to go now and rebuild my life spiritually? Is there a church out there? I've been through all of that. My friend took another job, fourth of the pay, and he's doing his best to keep his head above water. Our bank accounts, in a second, the enemy can destroy what we've worked for. What about our character? One person to start one rumor and we're in trouble. We're in jeopardy. We're now put on the defensive. That's why I've told people, when it comes to somebody telling lies on me, I'm not going to defend it. You want to believe a lie? That's your business. You want to know the truth? You call me up. We'll sit down together. I will answer your questions. But I'm not going to go into defense mode over something that's untrue. I'm not going to give the enemy that much power in my life. What about our church, our families, our friends, and our lives of faith? My faith is shaken. you said it. I've said it. Others have said it. I'm going through this horrible time in my life. And I even remember talking to a young man a few years ago that said to me, Ron, my faith is so shaken, I'm not even sure I believe in God anymore. This is a boy that could quote the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. This is a boy that could put me to shame in what I know about the Bible. 
He knew more than I did. But yet his faith was shaken. If we don't guard these things, guard them, build a fortress around our children, as we were told in the book of Job, when the enemy went to Job and, 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 and God said, no, you can't have Job. And he said, but well, why not? And he says, because Job's a good man. The enemy stayed on God and stayed on God until God finally said, okay, I'll let you try Job. Go ahead. And, and the enemy said, I can't because there's a fence around him. There's a hedge around him, which was spiritual. I can't get to him. You want to guard your life? You want to guard your children? You want to guard your church? You want to stand guard and be spiritually accounted for for the cause of Christ? Just pray and say, Oh God, put a fence around my children as they go to school today. Oh God, put a hedge of protection around them. God, put one around me. That's what we're talking about. Building that hedge. Keeping on guard. If we don't guard these things, we're in danger of losing them. Look what else we learn from the book of Nehemiah. In verse number 3, And I said unto them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them and appoint watches of inhabitants of Jerusalem. Everyone in his watch and everyone to be over against his house. Nehemiah's enemies were Sanballat and Tobiah. Our enemies all have different names, by the way who wanted to destroy the wall in Nehemiah, but ultimately his enemy was the devil. Interestingly enough that his name is spelled with the word evil in it. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Your adversary, the devil, walks around, prowls around, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan really wants to destroy what we have worked so hard to gain. He wants to destroy our families. He wants to destroy our schools. He wants to destroy our friendships, church ministries, and most importantly, not that these others are not important, but he knows once he destroys our life of faith and he strips from us that which we have built our spiritual lives on, he knows he has us. But we must not let him. But how can we? Proverbs 4.23, above all else, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Right here. Don't let the enemy get your heart. Something else that we learned from the book of Nehemiah. Interestingly enough, a few weeks ago in our Wednesday night Bible study, I was talking about this very picture. And I even said to our group, I am really not fond of pictures of Christ. I'll be honest with you because we don't know what he looks like. And I would never want anyone to get an impression that the pictures that we see of Jesus are what he looked like. But this picture, I found it. And I thought it fit perfectly into the message this morning. Because the best way we can guard what we've worked so hard to build is by trusting in God and by asking Jesus to come into our hearts. When we do, then they will become our gatekeepers and protect us from Satan. May God help you to accept Jesus Christ as your gatekeeper, your Savior into your heart today. Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice... And open the door, I will come into him and sup with him, and he with me. I want you to look at that picture really good. Look at it real good. Not so much at the person standing there, but I want you to look at the door. One of the things we talked about in our Wednesday night Bible study was there is no doorknob on this side. There is no door handle. Because Jesus Christ will not force his way into anyone's life. He stands there at your heart's door knocking, wanting to come in. Have you done that yet? Have you willingly opened your heart's door to the Savior of the world? To the one that Isaiah spoke about when he penned these words once again. His name shall be called Wonderful. His name shall be called Counselor. The Mighty God. The Prince of Peace. His name shall be above all names. Have you asked that one to come into your heart and be your Savior? If you've not, I want to encourage you to do that today. You have heaven to gain, hell to shun. Those old preachers, I used to love to hear them preach, boy. They'd say, you got heaven to gain, hell to shun. You got the joys of heaven, or you got the flames of hell. Those old boys could preach. And when they preached, they had a way of getting our attention. Let me ask you again. Jesus right now is at your heart's door. Have you ever, I'm not talking about religion, I'm not talking about denomination, I'm not talking about a relationship with the church, relationship with the pastor, no, I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Have you ever asked Him to come into your heart and be your Savior? If not, let Him do that today. Look at verse 2 again. It says that I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. In this chapter, so far we see Nehemiah appointing all kinds of people. He appointed gatekeepers, singers, Levites, a mayor, a sheriff, priest, and temple servants. But he entrusted his leadership to others, and because of this, his city grew. I cannot, and I will not, do it all. I'm not Superman. I'm Clark Kent. I don't fly around all day long and hang my cape up at night. There are others who do so much around here and I appreciate everything that they do. At the beginning of his career, Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, had a few department stores. Wanting to grow his business, he asked his managers if they wanted to become his business partners by investing and overseeing their own stores. This was a great risk he was taking, but excited by the opportunity, the manager, managers took ownership of the stores and worked hard. As a result, by 1962, Sam Walton and his brother owned a total of 16 stores in three states. Later, they grew to become one of the most powerful department stores in history. This is the secret of their growth, and it is the secret of your growth. We must entrust our leadership to others, and we must accept the opportunity to lead when it's given to us. And when God burdens your heart for leadership, do it. Something else I want you to notice. Second, Nehemiah registers the people. Again, we're not going to read all those verses, but notice here in verses 4 and 5. Now the city was large and great, but Nehemiah, but the people, excuse me, were few therein, and the houses were not builded. And my God put in mine heart to gather all the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found register of the genealogy of them that came up at first and written therein. In the church, we take church roll. We have people's names down. We have guest cards that we give out. All of this is just like what they did then. God helped Nehemiah to register all the families. What was the point of this? After registering the people, Nehemiah knew everyone who was in the city. He knew the first ones who returned from exile. He knew the families and how many were in each family. He knew the priests, the spiritual leaders, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, the temple servants, the descendants of the servants of King Solomon. He even knew those who couldn't prove that they were descendants of Israel. By writing down everyone's name, Nehemiah made them feel truly valued, appreciated on who they are. Our true value as a human being is not really based on what we do or what we have. It's based on who we are. Look at this. Interestingly enough, Jesus is the best example of one who values us for who we are. Not what we do, not what we own, not what we have. Once after arriving in the region of the Gersens, Jesus was met by a man who was possessed by 6,000 demons. Upon meeting him, Jesus didn't say, You horrible, sinful man. What did you do? What did you do to make you possessed by so many demons? But rather, Jesus gently asked him, What's your name? Jesus valued this man for who he was and not for what he'd become. Then Jesus drove out his demons. Immediately after this, this man wanted to follow Jesus for the rest of his life. He felt so valued and so loved by Jesus. When I sit down and I talk with people, sometimes because of the life they've lived, they want to clear their conscience and they want to say, you know something, Ron, I've not lived the best life and I've done this, this or this, and none of that matters to me. I value people as, as, as a person. It doesn't matter to me what they did yesterday. What they did last week, what they did last month, what they've done with their life up to this point. What matters to me is what matters to God. What are they willing to do from this point on? If you're going to hold someone in judgment, you ought to hold yourself in judgment. Sometimes we look at people's lives and we're so quick at pointing the finger and saying, well, you know, they brought this on themselves. The truth, again, is if we brought so much on ourselves, then we deserve to die and go to the place where self-centered, egotistical sinners go. Hell. 
Another story in the Bible. You remember this story, don't you? Those of you who have studied the Bible or heard the story. Oh, another time when Jesus was sitting at a well. A woman came up to the well to draw some water. This lady, according to the Bible, had lived a sinful life. She had been married several times and was now living with a man who was married to someone else. Upon seeing her, Jesus didn't rebuke her, saying, You sinful woman, what's wrong with you? Repent. Instead, Jesus valued her as who she was. After a long and meaningful conversation with her, this woman repented of her sins, accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior, and began to tell the whole town what he had done for her. Jesus is in the rebuilding business. Jesus is in the reconstruction business. Jesus wants to rebuild, wants to reconstruct people's lives. Though he could do it on his own, he has asked us who are Christians to help others do that. And if we go at them with an attack, we're going to turn them off. However, if we go at them, addressing them in the name of Christ, out of a spirit of love, that doesn't mean we agree with their sin. I don't expect anyone to agree with me if I had fallen into sin. I want someone to help me, though, restore, rebuild, reconstruct my life. Something else here. Third and last, Nehemiah asked for financial support, verses 70 and 72. Finally, to grow the city, Nehemiah needed financial support. He wanted to restore the temple, but he couldn't do it on his own. So he set the example by giving 270 ounces of gold, 50 ceremonial bowls, 530 robes for the priest. And we're going to, just in a moment, I'm going to show you what all that really means. After this, the heads of families gave their gifts. Then finally, the rest of the people gave their offerings. They were moved to see that Nehemiah himself, the one who led the project from the beginning to the end, was the first to give his offering, and it was the most. Nehemiah didn't do this for recognition, or to look proud, or for people to say, look at him. But he did it because of his love for God. For God loves a cheerful giver. The people recognized this and they also gave to God willingly. The amount of money given was more than five million dollars in today's terms. Now let's go back and for just a second and think about those people that worked on the wall. Ordinary people like you, like me, called upon by an extraordinary God to do an extraordinary work. And God never let them down throughout the rebuilding of this wall. From the very beginning, God equipped them with the right tools, the right weapons, the right attitude, the right work ethic. He did that. It wasn't easy. There was internal conflict at times. Bottom line is, these people came together for the work of the rebuilding of the wall and it's amazing what they gave. That is a miracle within itself. The point is, God is pleased when we give to Him what we have. He doesn't ask for much. God only asks that we give our first fruits. But when we give, God always gives it, pressed down and running over in return. He's an awesome God, isn't He? Look what else. Verses 70, 71, 72, and 73. And some of the chief of the fathers gave unto the work. The Terhashta gave the treasure of a thousand drams of gold. The word drams is another word for grams. So many grams of gold. They weighed it out. Fifty basins, 530 priest garments. And some of the chief of the fathers gave to the treasure of the work 20,000 drams of gold and 2,200 pounds of silver. And that which the rest of the people gave was 20,000 drams of gold and 2,000 pounds of silver and three score and seven priest garments. So the priest and the Levites and the porters and the singers, notice they all work together. And some of the people and the Nethamites and all Israel dwelt in their cities and when the seventh month came the children of Israel were in their cities that would be right around October 6th look here some of the heads of the families made voluntary offerings for the work 
The governor made a gift to the treasury of 1,000 drachmas of gold, which again would be about 19 pounds of gold, 50 bulls and 530 garments for the priest. Some of the heads of the families made gifts to the treasurer for their work. It came to 20,000 drachmas of gold and 2,200 minus of silver, which is about one and a third tons. Imagine that in the back of somebody's truck. Gifts from the rest of the people totaled 20,000 drachmas of gold, which is about 375 pounds, 2,000 minus of silver, and 67 garments for the priest. The priest, Levites, security guards, singers, and temple support staff, along with some others, and the rest of the people of Israel had a place to live, and they had a place to worship. Isn't it awesome to know that when you leave here today, you can go home? Get in your car, drive home, open your door, and you have a place to live. It may not be the ideal home, but you have a place to live. You can sit down on the couch. It may not be the newest couch, but it's a couch to sit on and lay on. You may not have everything you need in the refrigerator, but isn't it nice to know that when you go there, you can open it up and there's something there. You go to the cupboard, it may not be filled with everything you want. The kids may sometimes curl their nose a little bit because all that's left is a can of bacon beans and lima beans. And You tell them if you mix them together, that's something that only special people get. You put ketchup on it, and mustard, or hot sauce, or you hope it goes down real good. But we have a place to live. And now we have a place to worship. What have we learned so far? This is it, folks. In this passage, we learned that we must never stop growing. But how can we? Do you remember what Nehemiah did after he completed rebuilding the wall? He appointed leaders. He registered the people. And he asked for help. What about you? What can you do? The possibilities are limitless. You can volunteer for something. You can initiate a project. You can entrust someone with your leadership. Bill Gates once said, At Microsoft, there are a lot of brilliant ideas. But the image is, they all came from the top. And he said, I'm afraid that that's not quite right. Bill Gates gets all the credit for what he does. But every day, there are thousands of people that work for Microsoft that keep Bill Gates going. God made all of us to grow. And we must find a way to keep on growing after our wall has been built. Action steps. Today, I will listen to God with all my heart and soul and apply this message to my life. Only you can fill in the blank. Today, I will. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, as we think about the message today and we think about the responsibility that we have to accept the challenge to the message, may we, Father, do what we know that we need to do. And that is, Father, follow our heart. If there be a Christian that would say, I need to come, spend some time in personal prayer, may they come. If there be a Christian that would say, I'm coming to spend some time in prayer for a family member or a friend, may they come. If it be a Christian that would say, I need to respond to the Bible challenge, may they come. If it be someone who says, I need to come, become a Christian, Jesus is standing at my heart's door knocking, I need to let him in. Or maybe, Father, we're simply going to pray for those who need to be prayed for. We pray, Father, this morning for Tommy Nyman, who's going in for surgery, Father, on his back. And I pray that as the great physician, that you would not only guide the surgeons when he goes in for the surgery, but Father, you'd give him peace of mind. And you'd let him know that you're with him every step of the way. We think of Josh Huskins, who's going in for surgery, Father, on his shoulder. Father, we know that, God, no surgery's minor, even though surgeries today are, for the most part, done as outpatients. We pray, Father, for Josh, and that, God, the surgery would find him doing well immediately afterwards. I think of Jim Davis who's going to be going in to have some surgery father on his hand for carpal tunnel. 
all these people, Father, going through these physical difficulties in their life. Father, you can reach down and you can give them the strength. And may we this morning, during this time of invitation, remember these people in prayer. Let's all stand this morning. As we stand this morning, just as I am, without one plea. The Bible says in John 6, 37, He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Whatever the need may be in your life, you can come this morning.